robotic thymectomy in patients with myasthenia gravis, neurological and surgical outcomes. Well, thank you. I would like to thank the organizing committee for giving me the opportunity to give this presentation. I'm a research fellow at the Department of Cardiothoracic Surgery in Maastricht, and I will talk today about robotic thymectomy in patients with myasthenia gravis, and I will not only focus myself on the surgical outcome, but also on the neurological outcome. So it may be a bit different for you today. Uh, as we already heard yesterday, there are two indications to do a thymectomy. The first one is in patients with a thymoma, and the second one is in patients with myasthenia gravis. This is a neuromuscular autoimmune disease where antibodies against the acetylcholine receptor destroy this receptor, as you can see here. And because of this, patients uh, experience weakness of their muscles with exertion. Most of the times, the first signals are ocular signals. Uh, patients complain of ptosis and diplopia, but later on also the bulbar muscles and also the muscles in the arms and the leg can have weakness. A thymectomy is at this moment indicated in patients with generalized myasthenia with antibodies against the acetylcholine receptor under the age of 50 years old. In these patients, you can find different thymus pathology. In the first group, where the onset of the disease is under the age of 40 years old, you often find a follicular hypoplasia, as you can see here below. This group is dominated mostly by females. In the late onset group, so the disease age is at uh, after 40 years old, you often find a atrophic thymus, and there's no gender preference here. And in 10 to 15 percent of these patients, you can find a thymoma. Also in this group, there's no gender <coughs> preference. Well, uh, we retrospectively analyzed all consecutive patients who underwent a robotic thymectomy between 2004 and 2012 for the indication of myasthenia gravis. We used the Myasthenia Gravis Foundation of America clinical research standards to analyze the neurological outcome. We had a medium follow-up of 33 months, and not all the follow-up was done at our hospital. This is because we are a referral center for robotic thymectomy, so 56% uh, of the patients uh, was followed up in other hospitals, but 80% of these patients were seen by two neurologists that are specialized in Myasthenia Gravis. And at our hospital, we have one doctor that saw all the patients. Well, we used the MGFA post-intervention status to classify the neurological outcome. And they state that you can only talk about complete stable remission if patients were not having any signs of symptoms of myasthenia gravis, also not with physical examination for at least one year. And patients were not having any form of therapy at that moment. And you can talk about pharmacological remission if patients were also not having any signs or symptoms of myasthenia gravis, but they were taking some form of medication. However, pyridostic mean is excluded from this group. We used the right-sided robotic approach. Uh, only in four patients with a thymoma that was localized from the left side, we used the left-sided approach. And in our opinion, you can do it safely from both sides. But uh, we prefer the right side because, in our experience, we think that the uh, maneuverability in the right side of the cavity is bigger. Well, in this period, 125 patients underwent a robotic thymectomy, and most of them were females. Uh, they were pretty young. The median age was 33.5 years old, and almost 90% of them had antibodies against the acetylcholine receptor. Patients that were seronegative were only eligible for surgery if they were suspected for a thymoma or if they had refractory myasthenia gravis. In 32%, we found a thymic remnant tissue, in 41% follicular hypoplasia, and in 24%, we found a thymoma. Well, the surgical results showed that there were no perioperative complications and we did not need any additional port access. The median procedure time was 123 minutes, and there were no conversions done for surgical complications. In four patients, we converted to a thoracotomy or a stenotomy, but it was only because of suspected invasion of a blood vessel of a thymoma. Uh, most of the patients could go home uh, the second or the third day after surgery, and in the beginning of our robotic program, two patients experienced a myasthenic crisis, requiring mechanical ventilation for a couple of days. And we learned from those two patients that we only operate on myasthenia gravis patients that have a stable disease. So if patients uh, are unstable, we treat them first with IVIG, and then they get the surgery, but not if they are unstable. 
And later on in our experience, we didn't see any myasthenic crisis anymore. So this occurred only in 2004 and 2005. Uh, the neurological follow-up of 105 patients was more than 12 months. Five of them were lost to follow-up, and none of them had a thymoma. So our neurological analysis uh, could include 100 patients. Here you can see uh, a Kaplan-Meier analysis. On the left, you see the proportion of patients without complete stable remission, and here the time and months. And we saw that uh, after three years, 17% of the patients was in complete stable remission, so not taking any form of medication without any signs of myasthenia. And the remission rate after three years was 29%. We use this statistical analysis because the MGFA recommends to use it after our thymectomy. Uh, this is a bit of a busy slide, but we searched also for predictive factors of yeah, predicting complete stable remission. And we checked for age, uh, gender, also for antibody status, uh, the severity of myasthenia gravis, histology, so benign thymic tissue or a thymoma, the duration of symptoms before surgery, uh, the type of myasthenia, so early onset or late, and um, pre-operative treatment with prednisolone. And the only thing that we saw was significant is that patients that were not taking prednisolone before surgery had a higher chance of getting incomplete stable remission. And this is probably because this group of patients has a milder myasthenia. Well, if you yeah, look at our results, we would have expected a bit higher complete stable remission rates. But uh, in the Netherlands, neurologists are a bit reluctant to stop drug therapy if patients are in remission because there are reports that show that <coughs> you can have a relapse of your myasthenic symptoms of 60%. So if you quit uh, therapy and patients are getting a relapse again, you have to uh, give them high doses of steroids and you have to start other drug treatment that can uh, last for six months before it uh, starts helping the patient. So they have to take prednisolone in high amounts for a couple of months. So in the Netherlands, we continue for at least two years the drug treatment before we stop it completely. Besides that, we also had a short follow-up period with a median of three years. However, our improvement rate of 77% was in line with literature. Well, concluding, we can say that robotic thymectomy in patients with myasthenia gravis is safe and definitely feasible, that you should only do it in stable myasthenic patients, not in patients with unstable disease, that we saw an improvement in 77% of patients, that one-third was in remission, and that if you're not taking prednisolone before surgery, you had a higher chance of getting incomplete stable remission. I would like to thank all the doctors in the hospital that are working in a multidisciplinary setting, uh, yeah, multidisciplinary team uh, for working on these patients, and I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you. So now we have a period for questions. Four minutes. Thank you very much for the excellent presentation. So if you'd like to, anybody with the question, you can come up to the mic, please, and uh, make you introduce yourself and let's have a discussion about the paper here. Uh, Ali Jalawi from Glasgow. Enjoy your talk. Um, can you give me a, ask you a question? I was a resident 30 years ago with Joe Cooper, and I looked into his results, and we produced the paper of transcervical thymectomy with a small incision, which is in like mediastinoscopy. And now I use a small five millimeter telescope, and we've got nice thymus. Results probably may be similar or up, and that's more serious. How do you convince me how, how to help to convince my managers to with more incisions to see how, what is the advantage of this on procedures which are well established with a smaller incision. I'm sorry, you mean what, uh, how I, I mean, can convince you? Have you read the transcervical thymectomy? Yeah, I read it. It's yeah. a small incision, it's like a mediastinoscopy, where they mm -hmm. use the, Joe Cooper used the Golliga retractor, and, and we got the thymus from the top horns, nice and complete, and I use the five millimeter telescope, which will show me whether where the phrenics are and, and the fat and all that. Why do I need to use several with a robot of $2 million? Why do you think the advantage? 
What is, are you surgically improved or what, what is the thing? Yeah, with the three-dimensional vision, you have a better view uh, of all the <coughs> thymic tissue in the area from the left phrenic nerve to the right and from the diaphragm but, but, up but, to the... But you will have a better view now with improvement on what Cooper did with the series we analyzed, is to have a nice telescope which mm -hmm. give you a better view as well. And instead of you having three or four incision, particularly in fem female patients, but can you also reach all the thymic tissue with that approach? Well, that, yes, exactly. You always see it in control down to the diaphragm, and that's what we always did, even before the telescope, which we use now. But we don't have experience with transcervical thymectomy right. in our uh, hospital, but what I read is that it's really difficult to learn. Oh, I didn't know. I didn't think I that. Okay. <laughs> I think we'd need another one-week conference to debate transcervical versus thoracoscopic versus sternotomy. So uh, it's not quite the right venue for that. But uh, thank you for your presentation. I was uh, wondering about the low level of stable remissions mm -hmm. and who defines a stable remission. Is it the surgeon or no. the neurologist? And have these data um, swayed the neurologists in any way regarding continuing to refer those patients for thymectomy? Oh, thank you for your question. Um, the neurologist uh, stated if a patient was in complete stable remission or not. Uh, around 80% of all the patients were seen by three experts in the field of myasthenia gravis in our country. Uh, so they have quite a consensus about the treatment. And uh, they are still sending patients to us because they... Um, they also think that you should continue the drug treatment for at least two years if patients are stable because you have a high chance of relapse. So the neurologists are happy with the results? Yeah, they were happy. Yeah. Other questions? Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.